Well, and the tool sucks, so that was all pretty much exactly for nothing. So this is one of the more amusing things. We put all that work into this and blew it up. Hey guys, Ryan Gill here with Hunt Primitive where we entertain, educate, and inspire. And on this video, you are going to be getting all pretty much the highlights or cliff notes of a few weeks worth of work in building, testing, breaking a lot of, and successfully using Stone Age woodworking tools. So now the reason for this video or all this work in the first place is because this is going to be going into my Stone Age series playlist on YouTube and in a future episode coming up fairly soon I am doing a complete Stone Age bow building video. So we're going out, we get a piece of wood and, and that's what you actually saw the very first part is I was cutting down the tree and blew up the tool that I was going to use for building this bow and that snowballed into a whole, you know what, let me go test, build and test all of this stuff before I actually start, start showing stuff to people that doesn't actually work very well. Because I don't want to have to fake my way through it. I want to show you the best tools to build bows with, with using only Stone Age technology. So as you watch through this video, you're going to see a lot of failures, but you're also going to see a lot of successes. And in that next video, so make sure you are subscribing. If you don't, uh, do please consider following along through the subscribe button and hitting that bell notification because when we drop that bow making video, that's going to be a pretty good one. And that, of course, is going to go again into our Stone Age series playlist, which we're going to have a big finish with at the end of this summer as well. So anyway, Hang with me and let's get uh, let's get to work on some tools. Well, you can see right there, it broke the stone tool right in half. No surprise there. And that was pretty gentle chopping. I'm frustrated with myself because I knew the answer, but I keep running this circle because I'm trying to come up with these sophisticated ideas of cool tools to show people, you know, on the YouTube channel, which is when reality sets in. The simplest answer is the best answer. There's no sense in creating hours and hours or spending hours and hours in creating these sophisticated tools that constantly need monkeyed with. You have to, now you got to make a new uh, chisel edge for this and and now you have to rehaft it and use these resources and you use it for a while And then when it's no good, it's a very purpose specific tool and I'm not saying that it's a pointless tool At all because we will inevitably use it and I'm gonna set it aside and at one point I'm gonna do a video and I'll be like found the perfect use for this tool It does it better than anything else. I'll have to do some further testing on that um you know, the bone stuff, how many hours we allocated into doing this because I wanted to make this kitschy, cool tool that, you know, I could go out and chop down a tree with, when the reality is I could literally go grab a really crappy piece of chert and smack a hand axe out of it in like two seconds. Like literally, it's as simple as taking a crappy hammer stone, a hammer stone and a crappy piece of chert and knocking an edge, just one little edge like that, now we're not talking about making this whole beautiful bifaced piece that we can go cut a tree down, but just this edge. We hold this in the hand, it's rounded, it's comfortable to hold, and it's very purpose specific, and now we can knock wood. There's nothing to go, there's no joint, uh, there's no composite bindings here, there's no pitch, there's no sinew, there's no rawhide wrap, there's no fitting of tools. It's, it takes 10 seconds to pick this up and smack an edge on it, 20 seconds, then we go out and use it, and if it does its job and we have to carry it, you know, 50 yards back home, cool, we'll take it and we'll use it again. And if it's like two miles, you just go, I don't care because I'm going to go find a new one out of the creek and smack a new tool out of it. As much as humans love to over-sophisticate things, we have to remember that some most of the time, the simplest answer is the easiest one. But if you, if you want to build a tool for a, a very specific purpose, that's wonderful and maybe we're gonna find a beautiful purpose for this tool. But if you wanna talk about just simply going and cutting down a tree, a hand ax has got to be the most basic and most efficient means of absolutely doing that. There's nothing to fail. And if you wanna make something that's really nice, um, that you're gonna keep and you're gonna pack around, cause say, hey, maybe you cut down a lot of trees and uh, 
then what you're gonna do is you're gonna hunt around for a really good rock like this one of course this is uh edwards chert or this georgetown specifically but it's really nice stuff and all we have to do is say cool we're going to keep this beautiful round edge to hold on to and now there's this wonderful flint on the inside i'll show you here in a second it's really really super nice stuff and all i have to do is put together a few nice hits with a really nice rock see now there's there's a probably a little knife blade or a arrow point or something and if we just take a probably sit down for five minutes we can make this beautiful hand axe in which we leave it rounded on this side and right now we could use this right now that's that's all we absolutely have to do is it's rounded on this side it's great to hold on to that is plenty plenty sharp in all you can see the the speed that we're kind of working through this this is a cutting cutting a branch off that's about as big around as a oh well, maybe a little bit smaller than the large end of a wood baseball bat it's gonna be a, it's like a 10 or 15 minute job it's not long it doesn't take hours to do this but we're going slow anyway because we want to do a nice job we're not just hacking this thing out this is primitive precision, if you will. Just about through it. All right, so now we're on this fun mission of finding Stone Age woodworking tools that work really well, that aren't necessarily composite, that don't break easily. And so decided to kind of revisit um, a peck and grind sort of adds or chisel different names for it different places you go and that is quite honestly where you take another rock and you peck it over and over and over now obviously that's not enough but then after you peck it over and over and over you take a more coarse abrasive stone and you rub all those little high spots off and repeat. I mean, you're really going to be looking at, at probably at least a day. And quite honestly, I'm not going to sit here and peck and grind this because I don't feel like I'm proving anything by doing it because I know it can be done because I have a friend that lives about an hour away and he specializes in peck and grind. So I'm with Michael Bradenbaugh and he is my go-to peck and grind expert because he's done a phenomenal amount of this kind of work and so instead of me trying to re-engineer it it's best to go with somebody that actually has done it and has used quite a bit of it so we can actually learn something about it instead of just hearing me ramble. So I think one of the biggest questions I had was why would I choose this tool over uh, something like a deer antler chisel or, right. or a napped tool as opposed to taking all the time that it takes to pack and grind this in. Okay, so a couple of reasons are, one is, it opens up an entirely new resource to be available to use as tools, because when you're using uh, flaked stone, flint, chert, agatized coral, whatever, when it's a cryptocrystalline type stone, that lends itself well to flaking, but that doesn't always give you uh, a really precise edge until you've you know, done a lot of pressure flaking, a lot of engineering to make a very nice keen edge. And then that edge typically doesn't last very long. So uh, with peck and grind, what you do is you take stones that tend to be more igneous in nature, a lot of metabasalts and things like that. So now you have a, a resource that occurs in large quantities in some areas and uh, so now I've got easy access to tons and tons of material. And uh, I would say it's, I think we discussed this before, would it be safe to say that this, is, this kind of tool is going to be more common in an area 
that may be lacking a nappable stem? Does that make sense? Uh, yes and no. Okay. Um, in that uh, these are not a good replacement for napping our, our nappable stone because while I can get a nice straight precise edge, mm -hmm. unless it's extremely high grade stone like jade or nephrite for example, you can't get an edge that is as sharp as a napped edge. So that's the right. drawback. Because I noticed whenever I was really experimenting with this, and folks probably watched the video, is I didn't find it to be a sharp enough edge to really be like a wood removal tool, right. more so a uh, chopping tool. But right. even then it was like I found a lot more success in having a, a simple, a very simple bi-faced um, hand axe was a phenomenal tool for exactly. that. And I'm thinking, well, why on earth would I spend the time to peck and grind this when I could take a hand axe? But if you don't have those large nappable resources in the area where you might have right. smaller amounts, but not necessarily a big one, this is gonna be, or if you have limited amounts of stone, instead of using a big one for a hand axe, you're gonna use this instead and save that high quality nap stone for another project. For other more. Right. Plus, gotta to remember too, not everybody's a napper. So, I mean, it's not like everybody did everything. Yeah. It's like today, we have people that specialize and, and some people are bankers and some people are lawyers and some people make bows and arrows for a living. But you could have a guy that doesn't make arrowheads very well, but he really does not mind sitting down and pecking and grinding right. one of these off and he'll just do this all day because that's his thing. Well, it's a resource and you can use it. It makes perfect Absolutely. sense. Absolutely. This particular resource sometimes occurs in very large pieces and we find that in the archaeological record of big stone axes and celts. I've seen celts, you know, like this long and that sort of thing. So now to cut down that really big oak tree, mm -hmm. I can start felling those things a lot faster in conjunct with using fire to do that yeah. uh, than I can with previous uh, technologies with that didn't exist during when everybody was just napping all their stone. Yeah. So this allows me not only a greater tool stone resource, it allows me to have uh, uh, a lot faster processing times of plant materials and that sort of thing, because these work on a completely different principle than nap stone because that edge isn't sharp. I mean, right. this won't it's cut not, my skin, it but it'll cut a tree down. Right. So the physics of that says that the more pressure I place on a very uh, precise point, it will create enough force to separate those fibers because the difference with this is this is not cutting the wood fibers. It's actually stressing them so much right. that they separate. Yep. Because again, won't cut my skin, <laughs> but man, it'll, it'll cut that oak tree down over yep, there. Absolutely. So th Again, because of the design of the tool, the way that it is now hafted, because this offers me different hafting options too, I can apply anytime we add a handle to a blade, you're creating leverage. Mm -hmm. So once I've done that, that changes how much force I can put on that bit, which also means that changes what I can do with that tool. All right, so we're revisiting the composite tool, and then this is the, kind of as promised, uh, an antler bit that I put in there. It's a piece of solid antler and of course it's a little thick because we don't want to snap it like we did the bone. And I hafted it in here really well, gave it a ton of time to dry. We got a hackberry right here so we're going to move right into essentially using this thing. Not trying to break it but not trying to be super nice. Like I want to actually use this thing and I'm going to try to remove material and see how this thing holds up. Now the idea of course is we don't want to just beat the crap out of it, but we want to use the tool. So first thing on the, off the bat, we're actually getting a lot of microchipping right along the edge of that. So that's definitely dulled the edge a little bit. And we're not really in here very deep at all. But keep going. I gotta get into the wood. All right, so here's what we're running into, is I'm actually getting tired of swinging that, believe it or not. We've really kind of dolled up the edge a lot. So we'd have to, we're getting to a point where we'd have to stop and regrind the new edge on it just from straight on the impact. You know, there's a difference if you set it here and then you tap it. And that's a possibility too that a guy could 
build a tool like this so you're not actually holding the handle and hitting it, but using it like this. But that seems like you'd stand a better chance of breaking the tool that way. And why would you do that if I could just hold that antler chisel and knock down? But I'm not, I'm really just not removing a lot of material as an adds. But let's just try chopping and see what happens if we try that. I think overall the, the chisel in general was a, a lot more productive could really direct our hits well. I think if we scaled it up, I think it would be okay. I mean, but overall, we're just not really accomplishing much. I mean, just sitting here beating this thing with a piece of antler. I think there's a better tool for the job. So again, do we really want to allocate hours and hours into building a tool like this? We can achieve a better result with a tool that has no conjoined parts and just works even better. So. Probably the one thing I'm really surprised about the most is that we actually have not broken this loose at all and it's just pine pitch and deer sinew, that's it. And with all that, it's not even broken the pitch loose because I actually used quite a bit of deer sinew and I squeezed it down really, really tight and it worked really, really well. Did a little bit while, uh, a little while. And it's just, that's how this stuff gets done and then maybe you get tired of playing with that for a while and you pick up a stone flake and you go back to scraping for a little while because actually this removes quite a bit of material but after a while it'll start to cup and dish and do everything else and then we're going to grab up the the stone and we'll grind all that stuff flat again until you have a shape that you're looking for, but it's like this is this is the allocation of time. This is the the realistic aspect of Stone Age tools is hours and hours and hours and uncounted hours of grinding, and you end up with a chisel that looks like this, and you test it just simply instead of mounting into something, but you test it with a wood baton, and you're hammering it. It works so well and there's nothing to break. It's so thick and meaty that it's not gonna fracture like the bone does. And it's not stone, so it's not gonna, you're never just gonna break this piece in half. It's like impossible, we'll completely blunt and round this before we ever break this antler in half. Because when it comes down to it, I have to put hours and hours and hours and days and days and quite literally weeks of building and testing and tuning and failing and building it again and trying something new to make this fancy, sophisticated composite tool when in all reality, that is probably the most effective tool that I could have. That, the stone knife, because it's super handy. We've already covered that. We do a lot of work with that. And then like this random finding a flake of stone that's got, that's got the bend break which to me really isn't an intentional tool. It's just you're finding one that works, just like I did. I'm looking on the ground, I pick up this tool that's got this beautiful edge, and it makes a beautiful scraping tool. And so I can go right through my midden that's this big, it's this huge pile, and find a, a piece that's got a perfect edge already on it that I'm like, that's an awesome edge. I could absolutely uh, grind with that. And then just use that for, for scraping, not grinding, but for uh, removing little curls of wood or antler. That's not even a good one. That's a piece of crap. The one that I had a second ago was actually really, really good, but I lost it. There it is. This beautiful edge where you can actually see the, the material that it's removing off of this. So it's stuff like this that we don't have to build a very purpose specific tool to be successful, but we can simply walk around all of the byproducts of all these other tools that you're making 
And sometimes these things are the best tool that you could possibly have. And if you do need a very, a very uh, purpose specific tool, you put the time into making a tool that's very simple without working parts, without the, the, the composition of putting wood to bone with, or wood, wood, yeah, wood to antler or bone or stone with pine pitch and sinew and rawhide and you hit it like five times and it explodes because sure can you build that stuff if you put enough time into learning how to do that and ironing out the best ways to do it can you build those tools to where maybe they work and we say cool well now we know this works let's combine this into the wood handle and drill it through and now this is something that we work with sure we absolutely can but that's if that's going to be if you're willing to put that amount of time in, which is a phenomenal amount of time, or you could literally just pick this up after you've made it, instead of trying to advance it further and putting it into the handle. Say I'm gonna hold it by hand, and I'm gonna smack it with a stick baton, and I can chisel everything that I want. Another tool that we use a lot in this video, but I didn't explain it very much in this video at all, is the stone knife, or the bison skinner as I call it. And we use that for scoring around pieces of wood and breaking them off. We score around bone, we score around antler. We do a lot of sawing and cutting with these stone knives. Now, I did not show them very much. You can see them working in this video, but I did not explain that very much. And that is because I have a whole video dedicated to those knives. Not only the use of those knives, but also the building and then the resharpening and the use of those knives. And that I will drop a link down in the description to that video. And also, again, you'll find it on that Stone Age series playlist that we have a link down in the description for as well. So make sure you check that out. So got a ton of these Stone Age tool videos uh, dropping now and in the future. So make sure you are following along with all that. All right, so here's some pretty fun test time. I've got a piece of hickory to test on, and this has been seasoning for well over a year. So this is dry hickory. I don't have another hickory analog. That's fine, it's kind of good to test some different woods anyway. So that's a piece of hackberry. So then of course we have some, some rudimentary tools here, just a baton to work with, and I've got our antler chisel which is probably gonna be good for getting it kind of started. And if not, I'll go get a sharp flake and start it with that. And we got our small, um, I'll be kind of peck and grind, add slash splitting wedge. And then here is a bigger one that's out of a, actually a much softer sandstone. It works so much faster because I don't care about any sort of edge retention. This is simply just for getting into that tight spot and then hammering it into a wedge and then just kind of for fun I've got a piece of uh, bison horn that I actually use as a flint napping punch but it's tapered really well and I've seen where people before have used pieces of deer antler to, to split wedge through pieces of wood and I've not had a lot of success with that but I have this anyway because it is it is rather thin here and then flails out so let's uh, just kind of work through we'll start with a piece of dry hickory and let's see what she looks like. See if we can split this thing fairly well. All right, we got a big old rock to hit it with now. We'll try that too. I don't think it's gonna do anything more. I mean, quite honestly, but. Oh, there it works, that worked good. Hammer size made a huge difference, so that worked. We actually have ourselves a split. So I had actually brought over a piece of stone to use also, but as of right now, I don't need that. So, all right, the baton, it doesn't, I mean, you can hit it pretty hard, but this carries a lot of, a lot of weight. So now what we're gonna do is we'll drive that in a little bit further. This. Let's go ahead and take the chisel and hammer it in. Now it's actually working so well. Why even try to use other tools? Let's go ahead and just work this a second see how this goes. This is dry hickory. I don't, it's not even holding it into place. But it worked good. It worked really good. That was it. Just the antler chisel. We split a piece of dry hickory really, really well. And it's about two feet long. 
So we actually didn't need any of this stuff anyway. We had one tool. Now if you're doing a whole bow stave, it'll take a little bit longer. Now, let's try this piece of green hackberry and see if we get any sort of different result out of it. And I'll go ahead and start it with the hammer stone. Big difference thus far. Takes a little bit more force. If you've ever tried to split green wood versus dry wood, you know that there's a huge difference. So we've already we've got a good split in this with the with our antler chisel that we also use for wood removal, but it's actually wedged. I can't I can move it, but I can't pull it out. So maybe maybe now this will make more sense that we take this piece and that did exactly what it was supposed to do. But that wouldn't have been as easy if the end wasn't tapered, which I understand. But then I still ask the question, well, why didn't we just, why couldn't we just take this that is naturally tapered? Like the antler or this horn grew like this. So why? Why allocate a ridiculous amount of time into making something with peck and grind when I can quite literally take a bison horn or a piece of deer antler, score it all the way around, snap it off, and hammer that in there and it releases our tool. So it does, it does raise some interesting questions. We'll use that again just for fun, because we can, and that split it the rest of the way. So. A plausible explanation, but we didn't need it. I could have done, we really didn't need this. Is it a plausible allocation for that tool? Of course it is, but our little piece of bison horn did the exact same job that this would have done, and this took no time to make almost. We literally scored around a piece of bison horn and snapped it off, and it's ready to go that fast. All right, so we learned a lot about what tools work and don't work, and so we're going to be using these tools, as I mentioned earlier in the video, on a complete Stone Age technology bow making video that's going to drop right here on my YouTube channel as well, here very, very soon. And when, when that video does drop, it's going to be found in that Stone Age series playlist. But then I'll try to remember to come back and drop a link to the video when it is done. So if you're watching this, say, you know, a couple months or a year from now, you can just go down and find that video pretty easily. But a couple of things I don't explain in this video, as you've tell, told, is when something starts to work, I don't use it a whole lot. I just say, cool, it works. Well, that's because all of that information is going to be in that bow making video. And so instead of taking up your time with that same process in this video, we're just going to shove it into the next one. And uh, you'll be able to see how efficiently those tools actually work and then how we've abandoned the tools, obviously, that don't work. All right, guys, thanks for following along with our primitive and Stone Age wood and bone and stone working tool video. Hopefully you learned a little bit of something and uh, save you some of the aggravation that I went through. And obviously I don't know everything there is to know about it. All I can do is put some things together, test it in some practical application, decide what I like and what I don't like, and then share that information to you based mostly on data rather than opinion. So anyway, thanks for following along. We'll catch you on the next adventure. And don't forget to check those links down in the description for those other videos and following along with the Stone Age series playlist as well. So again, thanks for watching and catch you on the next adventure. As much as humans love to over sophisticate things, we have to remember that some most of the time, the simplest answer is the easiest one.